So uh, this in this teaching with technology session, Chris Lee, who's the electronic resource librarian, um, and Nick Gittins, who is the library assistant, is going to talk to us about the changes in course reserves and how um, other areas in the library have changed in response to the pandemic. Um, and so take it away. All right. So I'll go ahead and start. I'm going to share my screen and then start uh, the PowerPoint. So there's the button. All right, can you all see this? All right. All right, so um, like you just heard, I'm Chris Lee. I'm the electronic resources librarian. I'm uh, the person who helps with uh, getting licenses and setting up electronic resources in the library. And uh, Nick Gittins, do you want to introduce yourself real quick? Or? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Nick Gittins. I work in course reserves and patron services at the library and have worked in that capacity for the past seven and a half years, kind of getting to know student students and what they need, course material, you know, that type of stuff. And I'm um, looking forward to telling you guys about what's going on in the library. Sounds good. Um, so we're giving this presentation today to help remind you of how some of our services work, um, update you on new developments and alert you to changes due to the coronavirus pandemic. Um, as we start the presentation, I would like you to think about what questions you have about course reserves, electronic resources, and the rest of the library, and how you can use our services this fall. Um, if any of your questions are not answered in the presentation, we will have several Q&A pauses between sections uh, uh, throughout, uh, so please feel free to write your questions in the chat, and we will answer them do during uh, Q&A. So, uh, Today, we'd like to talk to you about what you can expect from course reserves, uh, service changes around the library, ways of finding electronic resources, how to link to library content, a new service called Lean Library the library subscribes to, and follow it all up with an ending Q&A for the rest of the session. So to start, uh, here's Nick Gittins. Oh, actually. Um, Sorry, in the chat box, if you want to real quick, uh, let us know of any library resources you use in your teaching or work um, that you've used in Canvas, that'd be a big help. And now on to Nick. Cool. Uh, thanks, Chris. And thanks to everybody who's presented today. It's been a really cool and informative conference. Um, I've had a lot of fun attending the sessions. So, and thanks to all of you guys for sticking around and attending our session uh, as well. So as I said earlier, I manage the course reserves collection at the Merrill Kazir Library. And unfortunately this year, because of the pandemic, we are not able to basically have a physical course reserves service desk. Um, our, all of our course reserves material generally checks out for a three hour period. And because it circulates so much, and we now have the need to quarantine this material for 48 to 72 hours after it circulates. Um, kind of the model that we've been operating on just isn't going to work for fall 2020. Um, that's not to say we're not here for you though. And we've been working diligently over the summer to come up with a couple of options for finding or accessing digital content. And I'm here to share those with you now. Um, so the first thing that I would recommend doing, if you have any questions about course material, if you're trying to find a digital copy of uh, something you used physically in the past, reach out to me at nick.gittins at usu.edu, and we can kind of begin talking about how to serve your students. Um, I can go ahead and look for a digital copy that, we, that provides access to the most students simultaneously. And when we have the ability to purchase it, uh, I've been given permission to purchase those. So definitely reach out to me and we can try to find you guys some textbooks. Um, if we are not able to find a digital version of your text, I can then facilitate a conversation with our open educational resources librarian. If you are interested in identifying open access options that you have, or I can facilitate a conversation with your library liaison to also begin talking about strategies for identifying alternative 
course material. Um, in some situations, we can offer limited scanning of content, um, and then we can kind of upload that to your Canvas page or work with you to determine the best strategy for that. Um, and right here in, the, in our presentation, you can see a link to our fair use evaluation tool. This is a tool that we use to kind of enter the material that you want to use for your course and also the circumstances that you're using it in, how you intend to use it. And you can kind of identify yourself whether you are able to scan the book and upload it to students or how much of the book you're able to scan and upload to students. Um, and then that last little email address right there, copyright at usu.edu, they actually handle all of the scanning requests. So um, basically, if we can't find a digital version of your textbook and you still want to use that book, I can facilitate a conversation with our copyright librarian in which you can start kind of identifying what you can scan and what will not be able to be scanned because of copyright laws. So yeah, uh, as I said, reach out to me uh, as soon as you can, as soon as you have a question and I can begin helping you facilitate some of these processes. Um, that's that for this slide. Okay. Cool, so the, the course reserves area doesn't just house the course reserves collection, it also houses the media collection our test prep material, our veterinary medicine collection, our kit collection, our jazz record collection, music CDs, DVDs, scripts, and music anthologies. Uh, because the service desk back here is closed, you can't actually get back into this area, but you can fill out this form that we have a link to on our page and, and request material from back here. Um, once you fill out that request, we'll pull it from the shelves back here and can deliver it out to the circulation desk where you can pick it up and check it out. I know that some courses have used things like the music CDs or the DVD collection or the, the script library. They kind of come in and browse and kind of get different. They don't like come in looking for a specific book. They come in to browse and see what they can find, all kinds of different information. We're still willing to facilitate that. Um, so faculty, students can reach out to me to schedule an appointment for actually coming back here and using some of our stuff. Um, we Obviously the space is small and so we have to kind of limit how many people are back here at a time and all of that, but we're, we're working hard to figure out ways to meet all of the challenges that we're facing and we're happy to help you if you reach out to us. So with that said, um, Faculty can also request streaming material. And you can see that link right here in this uh, slide as well. Chris will talk about that a little bit more later though. So that pretty much covers the course reserves and the library media collection area. As I said, we have no physical desk and we won't be providing a physical course reserve service this fall. We are trying to provide digital alternatives when we can. Um, and yeah, so with that said, I'd like to move on to some of the other physical changes that you can expect to see around the rest of the library this summer, or sorry, this fall. So during fall 2020, face coverings are required for all visitors and staff in public areas per USU policy 20T3. Food and drink are no longer allowed in the building either. If you have like a water bottle or something in your dropping your mask to drink out of the water bottle. We're probably not gonna harass you, but no food in the library uh, for the foreseeable future. We've also adjusted our hours. Um, Monday through Thursday will be open from seven to nine, Friday from seven to five, Saturday from 12 to five, and Sunday from 12 to nine. And this is so we can bring in an extra cleaning crew to kind of go over the high use areas of the library and just make sure everything's clean and ready for the next day. In addition, all research and reference support is going to be virtual through fall 2020. So you can visit our library webpage and you can get research support through our chat. There's like a little chat with a librarian link right on the main page. Um, somebody's always on that from nine to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday, or you can click 
the alter or alternatively, you can click the Meet Your Librarian link on that page and look up who your liaison librarian is and sort of schedule a digital meeting with them. Our interlibrary loan services are also slowly returning to normal. A lot of our partners have not resumed their interlibrary loan services, so we may not always be able to get the book you're looking for, and we may not always be able to get it as fast as we have in the future. But uh, we expect as more and more institutions come online throughout the fall, that that, that process will begin speeding up and stuff. But there, just so you're all aware, there are possible delays in the interlibrary loan process. Other than that, the library has a COVID-19 policies page that is accessible. If you go to library.usu.edu, there's a link right there on the front page to all of our policies where you can find any of the information that I've talked about today, um, as well as contact information and stuff. But as I said, don't hesitate to reach out to me with any questions you have and we can start talking about course material and how to help your students. Um, thank you all for supporting course reserves in the past and we hope to be back this spring. So with that, I'll pass it back to Chris. Oh, actually, you know what? I'll give you guys a chance to ask me any lingering questions you have about course reserves before we hand back to Chris. Feel free to ask them in the chat or you might be able to unmute yourself and just ask. Cool. We have a small crowd, so if there aren't any questions, it's cool if you want to move on and show them about our okay. electronic resources, Chris. Sounds good. Uh, thank you, Nick. Um, so we would now like to talk to you about electronic resources, uh, starting with how to find resources you or your students need. There are a few common ways I've seen with how patrons use the library for research. They can use the quick search box on the main library webpage, which is pictured here. Or they can look up a specific database that will likely have materials on the subject they are researching. Many of you are no doubt experts uh, at doing research using the library website to find online materials, but it might still be useful to go over how a student might try and use quick search. And now many students may first try to use Google for research and that can be an issue because even if the student finds a good academic peer reviewed article, they will probably hit a paywall. This is why we recommend using our website which prompts patrons to authenticate to access academic materials purchased or subscribed to by the library. Now quick search is an obvious way students may attempt to find research materials because it's on the main page, the first thing you see. So say I am a freshman doing a first time paper and I'm going to go ahead and just kind of go through what I would do. So when I was a freshman um, at Utah State University, I was asked to research civil rights mirrored in popular culture. So let's try that. Helps if I spell right. Okay. Loads. All right, so I've got some materials here, you know, um, kind of hit or miss. There's a lot of these that are academic journals, ebooks, a uh, book, a periodical. So say I'm a freshman student panicking, trying to write something the night before, I'm gonna wanna limit it to academic journals. And per my uh, uh, common request by faculty, probably gonna want to have it be peer reviewed. So do that and have it in the last five years is another common thing, so. All right, so now it's been filtered down and, and I have, have some results, but they aren't that great. Um, our quick search tool looks at almost everything we have, plus connects to a knowledge base that shows items we don't have that may be requested through interlibrary loan. Because of this, it can sometimes be like trying to drink from a fire hose to try to use it. So, better, so for better results, it is often better to go to a database with a narrower focus. So let's go back to that. And so to get to the databases, you can go to uh, articles and databases here on the main page. 
Uh, now, my favorite one when I was a freshman was Academic Search Premier. It's now Academic Search Ultimate. Um, it's a fairly broad uh, database on many topics, but it's still going to be a bit more narrow than, than um, the Quick Search. So let's go ahead and try that same search, Civil Rights, and Popular Culture. All right. And, you know, I'm going to want to do the same limiters. Uh, don't have to limit to article in this because everything in here is going to be articles. So scholarly journals, full text, and let's do uh, 2016 to 2020. All right. So I've got some results here. Um, but they're still not that great. Um, and a lot of this is because uh, I didn't have very good terms. I mean, I've got, um, you know, here's something with Beyonce. That's definitely popular culture, um, but it's, it's, you know, it's not great. So let's do what I did in my freshman year and limit it to comic books because that's the kind of guy I was and am still. And go to there. And, you know, I'm seeing some more, some better results, not very many results, but, um, you know, here's you know, teaching human rights in graphic novels. I definitely would have used this one when I was a freshman. Um, so these are some better terms. And with some tweaking, a student would be able to find what's going on. So that's kind of a, an average experience for a freshman student. Now, uh, but they're not the only ones who use some of our databases. Um, there are many databases on many topics. Um, as you can see here, there's agriculture, arts, natural resources, on and on. Um, so, but what if, about if I'm looking for something completely different? Maybe I am a faculty member doing online teaching and I want my students to watch a documentary as part of their homework. Well, how would I find what documentaries are available? Well, I would go to the articles and database list here and I would scroll down to where there's resources by type. So you got the eBooks, audiobooks, government, ah, streaming audio and video. So if I go in there, here's all our streaming um, content. And our most popular one is uh, Alexander Street Academic Video Online, which will let you get a lot of videos. Um, some of them um, more academic, most of them fairly academic in nature, a few of them a little bit, you know, um, a little pop culture-y, but so, you know, you could search around here and find a lot of stuff. Um, outside of doing online teaching being common right now, um, on everyone's mind, of course, is the coronavirus. So say you want to do uh, coronavirus research in your subject matter for the year. Now there's uh, two coronavirus page pages we have. There's temporary access. These are all going to be uh, materials that publishers have temporarily made free um, and open access, but it's gonna be on all sorts of topics. These are just things we have for a short amount of time. This list is updated and changed all the time. But if you want specifically on the coronavirus itself, there's the coronavirus research page. This is made up of uh, uh, publisher content that they've decided to share about the virus. Um, so up-to-date uh, publications, uh, government pages, and uh, news organizations. All of this stuff is open access right now, and there's a good amount of content here. So if you want to do research on the virus itself, pandemics, or um, other coronaviruses, uh, this would be a good place to start. All right, so let's get back to the PowerPoint. All right, so those are a few ways uh, people often look at, uh, look at uh, using our search functions and finding materials in the library. Um, before I move on, are there any questions real quick? Or questions from the previous section? Okay. Well, go ahead and ask it. If one pops up, um, someone please let me know. I can't really see chat from this view. 
All right. So uh, sometimes you might want to assign your students specific reading. You could download an article you want your students to read and upload it to Canvas. Or you could link to the resource. There are a few reasons why the library would prefer you to link patrons to an article rather than to upload the PDF to Canvas. So unfortunately, some of our licenses that we agree to when we subscribe to a resource can be annoyingly restrictive. While the vast majority would be fine with you sharing a PDF with a student who can already go and download the same article from the same place, others may prohibit that behavior. So it's uh, just a good practice to have, um, to have our best practices be acceptable to all publishers than to make everyone try to remember particulars of hundreds of different licenses. Another very important reason is that an uploaded PDF won't be counted as usage by the library. Uh, but sending a link to a student so they can access the resource from the library will be counted as usage. So, but why does usage matter? Put simply, we make decisions on whether to renew materials based on usage. Every year or so, we have to renew each individual subscription and pay for the next year, two, three years um, upcoming. Uh, since publishers often increase the cost of a renewal by uh, one to 5%, we sometimes cannot afford to renew everything, especially if it's not used a lot. And there's a lot of new content people request and they want to use in their courses. So for an example, if you go to a database and download an article and upload it to Canvas, the publisher will see that one copy was downloaded by a USU patron, but that's it. A few other people may also use the same database, so there may be other uses, but that's not something we can necessarily count on, especially if it is a very niche database. But if you share a link to that same article, usage will go up dramatically. So if you download from that database in September, read it, and decide to add it to your lesson plan for October. Um, in October, your 25 students will then download the article for the assignment. Hopefully, some of those students will remember the database, and the next time they need to do research for a paper, they will use it to find more materials, increasing usage month after month. This could easily make the difference between deciding to renew and seeing this niche database as expendable when the budget needs to be lightened. So basically, we want to know that you're using the stuff. Now, with the pandemic sweeping the country, off-campus access is more important than ever. Some links you copy from the library website or databases will work on campus just fine because you are using an on-campus IP address to surf the internet. This is because we give publishers our IP ranges when we subscribe to new content to enable access to that content. If you are off campus, your IP number won't be in the on campus range and publishers will put up paywalls for access because they don't know that you are associated with the university. To get off campus access, we ask users to sign into their library through a proxy server to make them appear on campus to publishers. This lets users access content anywhere, but it requires the user to sign in. To ensure your students are asked to sign in when they use a link shared on Canvas, you would, should, should use our URL prepend. The prepend will force the user to log in before taking them to the website you are linking to. So to ensure your students are directed to sign into the library and avoid being confronted with a paywall, please add the library prepend URL to the beginning of the URL you want to share. Now, Library IT recently updated to a new prepend that is easier for them to troubleshoot a few things with. So it might be worth noting that the new, what the new one looks like if you are already used to using the prepend. Your old links with the old prepend will still work though. Um, and you can see the new prepend right here. All right. To use the prepend, simply add the URL to the materials you want to share or after the prepend to create one single link. So here's the prepend, and you're trying to get them to Ibis World. So here's the Ibis World link. And Nick, um, sorry. Oh, sorry, Chris. Oh, um, that's it fine. Does look like you have a question from Lauren in the chat mm -hmm. yes. asking if you 
going to be an easy step-by-step -step guide for this somewhere um, just because it her students always get confused and annoyed and then don't read the instructions and then <laughs> yes um, uh, that sorry go ahead oh no and then I think she asked if the prepend would make it all automatic so she doesn't have to give instructions at all or the way that works uh, if you put the prepend in front of the URL when they click it, it'll prompt them to sign in through their, sing, um, their single sign-on. And so it should be automatic. They shouldn't have to have steps to get there. It would just be, you click this, and then you're right at the journal or the specific article or whatever URL you shared. So it should be pretty intuitive for them. But um, there is a, uh, uh, there is a, um, a libguide on how to use the the prepend um, and to find it just go here on the main website to research guides and search prepend and it will come up with step-by-step -step directions that you can share with your students you can link them to that you won't even need the prepend to link to that page and that should uh, prompt them to to get on how to use it um, does that answer your questions Yes, perfect. Thank okay. you so much. All right, so, um, so uh, our, moving on, um, another kind of content you might want to link to in Canvas is streaming media. Most of the links in the catalog already actually have the prepend attached, so you should be able to just drop those links into Canvas and you'll be good to go. Uh, same goes for if you see a button to select what's called the permalink in um, Avon, um, our most used streaming service. Um, those should work as well. Um, now, while it is great to share links to streaming media, there is an additional thing you should be aware of. These links change a bit more often than other types of links the library uses. So if you teach the same course every semester, you should just double check to make sure the link still works before you send, that, send it out to your students. Now, also, if there is a certain video you want to use that isn't curr currently available, please fill out the streaming re request form and the library staff will see if it's something the library can get. Uh, the request form is right here, but also um, if you search in, in the, for the request form in the, in the research guides, you should get information on that as well. Um, lastly, I know this is a quick overview, but the content on streaming I've covered plus more can also be found in our streaming libguide, which will also connect you to the, that guide. And it's just right here. Just search streaming in the research guides page and it'll, it'll take you right to that. So that was a lot. Um, before we move on, are there any more questions about library content you would like to cover? Okay, um, since I can't see that, um, if one pops up, uh, please let, let me know. I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the next session, section. So, last spring, the library subscribed to a new service called Lean Library. Lean Library is a browser extension that will alert users when they reach a resource the library has access to, regardless of how they arrived at that resource. So users who naturally turn to Google when they do their research will be prompted to log in to get past any paywalls and access the resource. This is also helpful if patrons are giving a link that doesn't have the prepend. Since Lean Library will recognize that uh, what items USU patrons should be able to access and it will prompt the login then and there to unlock the full version. So I'm gonna, give a quick demonstration of Lean Library because it is somewhat hard to visualize. So I'm just going to jump out here. Now first, I'm going to try a browser that doesn't have Lean Library. Now, say I am an anthropology first year student using a really bad uh, search term, but let's go for it. Anthropology academic articles. Now I see this link here, it says online library. That sounds good. That's probably good, got good stuff. So I click in there. Uh, browse AAA journals, that, that sounds impressive. Um, oh, Anthropology and Education Quarterly, let's try that. 
Um, I see this first article. Um, okay, let's see. Let's read that. And I hit a paywall. Uh, 48 hour online access for $7. Online access permanently for 16, but if I want a PDF, that's $42. And most freshmen are definitely, if not all freshmen are not gonna wanna pay any of this. And they shouldn't have to because the library subscribes to this, to this resource. So I have Lean Library installed as a extension on my Chrome browser. So let's do that same search. And up oh, Anthro source again. And should pop up. Ah, there it is. Here's uh, Lean Library pops up saying get access. Um, so I click that. It's telling me to sign in. Now, since I previously had done a single sign in on this browser, um, the, the single sign on page did not pop up. Normally that would pop up, but since I was already signed in, it just was like, oh, you're signed in. Um, but you should all know what the single sign on looks like if you've used uh, ag email or anything like that. Um, but you can tell that we have access because it says access by Utah State University. And if I go to the same journal, now it says full access and I click the PDF. And there's the PDF. I now can read it and do my research. So that is the main thing that uh, Lean Library does, but it actually has three parts. There's library access, library assist, and library alternatives. Now, library access is the main module that does what I just demonstrated. It alerts users when they stumble into content so they can sign in on the spot and access the resources they want. This module also connects directly to Google Scholar and PubMed to let them know to list items accessible through the library, just to make the whole thing easier. Library Assist allows us to make custom alerts on any web page we want. So far, we haven't used this feature, but we can put a message to let patrons know when a database they are attempting to reach is experiencing network issues or something like that. Um, or we can even have it share a link to relevant libguides. And um, that's something we're looking into right now, but we haven't implemented anything in that module yet. The third module is library alternatives. This module lets patrons know if there is an open access version of the material they are trying to access, or if it is not available through the library or open access, it can direct patrons to interlibrary loan to request a copy of the article from another library. So it's just more ways you can find the articles you are looking for. So how do you get Lean Library? There are links on the library webpage or you can just Google Lean Library and download it from the site. Um, last time I gave this presentation, people asked for to see that. So I'm gonna quickly show that on uh, Safari. I've never downloaded it on Safari, so let's go there. Uh, just search Lean Library in Google, download. It senses that I am using Safari, um, but it is available on all of these uh, browsers as well. Um, so most people should be able to find something that they like to use. So I'll go ahead and download that. And it pops up the App Store Get that installed. It's a very fast install. Um, oh, that's not good. There we go. So it is downloading and open it up. Preferences, it's just going to ask for permissions. Yep. And now Lean Library is in Safari. So it'll, this is what happens when you try something on a live thing. Um, let's try opening that again. 
Ah, there we go. So it, all it's going to ask you is to select your library. So you just type in Utah State University. Um, and then from now on, it will pop up whenever um, I hit stuff that, that it has access to. And it'll prompt me to sign in uh, to do the single sign in. Technically, anyone could download it and put it on the computer and say they're from Utah State. But once it hits the single sign on page, if they're not affiliated with the university, it won't do them any good. And it gives a little video if you want to watch it on how to use Lean Library. So that is uh, Lean Library in a nutshell. Um, it's a new service um, done, uh, that we subscribe to at the, at, at the library. Uh, we also have more information on it on our LibGuide. But uh, one of the things that you might be concerned about is privacy. A lot of people want to be assured that the extension doesn't send personal information to the product owner, uh, Sage Publishing. According to their privacy policy, they do not collect personal data and the extension activates when it sees an, appropriate, an approved website. Um, so basically, if the website you are currently on isn't on the list of libraries the library sent to Sage Publishing, it won't activate at all. It'll simply ignore that web page and keep waiting to get to one um, on its range. So yeah, um, that is, for more information, there's the LibGuide and you can contact me. Um, so yeah, that's our presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, um, you can ask them now. You can also, if you think of any later, you can contact uh, me or Nick. So thank you. Yeah, we're happy to answer any questions about the resources or the physical building, course reserves, anything you guys are wondering about the library.